Thank you, Claudia. Great stuff. Um, so we've got some cool guys from overseas and um, we got um, uh, Walter and Alex, you will see in the demos. And uh, on the way there, the Spülbohr machine or horizontal directional drilling machine, as uh, is probably called. Thank you. Um, so um, uh, we will now do the Q&A here. We have 15 minutes. No? 15. Okay. So, Akil. Um, hi, Claudia. I just had a couple of um, clarifications, some of the charts that you showed us. Um, you had one chart where you were showing the cost of delivering a megabit of data mm -hmm. on LTE and then how it changes with 5G. Can you just help us understand why is the cost underlying going up over time pre-5G? So is that spectrum constraints and what, what are the kind of deltas there? And then we think about 5G, um, the cost falls, but it doesn't fall hugely. Um, what are the assumptions? What, what are the things going on there, firstly? Um, and then the second thing, you've talked about um, automated factories and warehouses and things like this. Um, in Germany, they're considering um, auctioning regional licenses. What are the conversations going on there, and do you think that jeopardizes that opportunity at all? Thanks. Um, to, to the first point, the uh, cost go up if you assume that the traffic grows annually by 45%. And then it will be at some point in time more expensive to upgrade a network where you have eight antenna elements per antenna than adding as an overlay a network where you have these 64 antenna elements per antenna. That's the main uh, reason for that. Um, on your uh, second uh, question, we actually are in discussions uh, with everyone to create a situation where we end up having a really investment-friendly environment for those actually players who um, want to roll out 5G on a larger capability. Yeah? Because as you said, rightfully so, otherwise it's a little bit cherry-picking and starting with the most promising opportunities. Yeah, but I mean, there's a bunch of uh, German industrial companies that have expressed some interest in this for campus networks. If they do it themselves, then, you know, we won't do it. But I don't think it's particularly efficient to do that uh, uh, for them. And uh, so, and also it's not efficient for the country to uh, uh, fragment the licenses. Yeah? Yes, plus what we also see, um, I have very strong relationships to many of these DAX board members and others that specifically when we offer something where we can bind uh, private coverage with publicly enhanced coverage, yeah? the combination of that networks in a hybrid network, and the um, capability to tailor that, yeah? so that you as the local network operator can really tailor that. There is something where our customers tell us that they actually trust in our technical capabilities to deliver. Yeah? But I also expect, Hannes, as you said, a certain learning curve on things, right? I think so. Yeah. Can, yeah. can I just ask one thing just to clarify on that? On, on the 5G cost falling and it not falling maybe hugely, just maybe a, a really quick clarification. I mean, how does the cost of delivering capacity on small cells, which you're talking about, compare to macro cells? Is, is there a very big cost differential given how early on we are in the small cell deployment phase in Europe? Yeah, so um, th you have to take uh, two things um, into consideration. You have on the one hand the efficiency gain in the antenna, which drives down cost, and then you have, on the other hand, the smaller cells. And uh, needless to say, the smaller the cells, the higher the cost. Yeah? Uh, of course, uh, implementing a small cell is then cheaper than implementing a macro cell, but overall, the cell densification is what usually drives the capex up. Yeah, very good. I'll have your question. Uh, hi, it's uh, Josh Hallett from Redburn. Here. <laughs> Great presentation, by the way. I love the enthusiasm. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, you talked about the rollout of 5G and fixed wireless access. Do you think it's realistic that you could have multiple mobile operators building that sort of infrastructure in the same area? Or is there going to be have, have to be shared infrastructure? So, on principle, uh, everybody could build the antennas right in the street. So, what you need to have is the fiber infrastructure in the street, yeah? And um, whoever does it, yeah? And uh, then, of course, you can build up antennas as you wish. But we have lots of, you know, situations like this. Um, we mm -hmm. have, we, tomorrow we talk about our tower business, mm -hmm. right? So, we share infrastructure, right? Yep. We have a vibrant third party business 
we have uh, provide backhaul for people. We do all these things, and you know that's e that's efficient. The contingent contingent model is the same. On fiber, we find similar solutions, and we talked about reciprocity earlier. So I think yeah. you will always have a mix of owning and not owning in in a large country such as this. Uh, but you know we will surely be um, you know quite front footed, and I think we have a bigger budget than um, some other people out there. So um, I think uh, Christian, you had a question, or has been asked that. No, still there. Good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, my question was uh, was a small topic mentioned earlier, the uh, the OTT product that you mentioned, uh, so that uh, a TV product that's being rolled out to every um, customer that, that basically does not have a DT product. So mm -hmm. could you maybe elaborate a bit on that one? So it's, it's actually um, so that you can use uh, content we are normally offering on uh, Entertain TV in an over-the-top product. Yeah, you can also when you have today our product, you can use it at home or you can use it on the move on your um, uh, pads. But that would be a product where we, you could just you uh, install the app and use a significant share of the content. Of course, it depends in detail on the content rights uh, on a, a normal pad without having the full Monty at home. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dan and Jay. Um, a quick question on the all IP transition. Which complexities did you underestimate in your all IP transition in Germany? Uh, and I guess the hidden question is, why are you confident that you're going to be able to get it done? So, uh, in the next couple of years? So actually, we learned a lot on the way. I think the biggest complexity was actually in the end when it comes to the forced migration. And as Tim said, the last 1% is the most difficult one because if in order to clean off something completely, you need to move the customers out. Yeah, And uh, that is a big complexity. Um, so why are we confident? Because when we look at um, how many get interrupted, right? When we look at the current speed of implementation, both on the consumer and on the B2B business, right? So, and if we extrapolate that now going forward, we are actually pretty confident that we get it done. Yeah, mainly because we accelerated massively already uh, throughout the last one or two years, right? And the BNG migration, yeah. which is... Hmm? So you have done this uh, yeah. yeah, we started, of course, we started, as you know, with all the smaller countries, yeah? And we completed the IP migrations in the small countries, even for the complex business, because they also have uh, nuclear power plants or they have airports, right? So we learned a lot in the smaller countries, very much, and then... When we moved over to Germany, we got over time pretty efficient in implementing the B2C business. And now we have here with Adele a joint task force right, in convincing the more complex business customers to also move to that technology. Yeah? But it really took a time, I have to say, in particular with regard to the more complex customers before we really got the argument right. At least it's better than Berlin Airport, Donald J. But it's, hey, that's uh, cynical. No, but it's, that's very cynical. But it's a, it, you know, it is a six, seven-year project, and we have a, a little delay. But that doesn't mean we have uh, C problems that we can't no. complete it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Ulrich, again. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I have uh, three questions. The first one is a clarification. Only allowed on two. Sorry. Oh, oh okay. Short? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> the last one is a very simple one, I okay. promise. Um, FWA, um, on FWA, just, just to clarify, if I understand this correctly, um, in, in a situation where, where, where you are dealing with a, um, an, an MDU where that has a f sort of front apartments and back apartments at the back of the building, the ones at the back of the building you couldn't service with this technology, um, if I understand correctly how this works. Um, so, uh, the, uh, what I mentioned is the challenge with microwaves is if you have something hard in between, a tree or a van, yeah, the connection gets interrupted. The way we solve it is actually via triangulation to use um, more than one antenna to actually bring the uh, required signal into houses. But what we have also learned in our trials, and we trialed it really in different topologies, yeah, in these dense urban, urban and suburbans, that indeed it does not work in every topology. Yeah? This is actually why we're saying, yeah, when you look at these different topologies, around about 20 to 30% of the households in areas where you have fiber around are actually suited for that. If you have too many walls in between, then even triangulation wouldn't help you to address that problem. Okay, thanks. Next. And second one would ah, be um, 
Coming back to this regional 5G and then these sort of um, campus projects from some of the uh, corporates, is there a big reduction in provisioning complexity in, in, the, in, the, in the 5G equipment that would make it possible for, say, some sophisticated IT department to, to deploy this? Is there a big step change? Because I think at the moment, carrier class equipment wouldn't be, wouldn't be handled. Like these guys couldn't handle this sort of stuff, right? So I'm just wondering, is, is this actually realistic that they go and, and buy licenses and then build a 5G campus network in their factory? <laughs> See, from our experience, um, there is one thing to actually provide an IT solution or even a LAN and to provide such an optimized mobile solution at home. We even see that within Deutsche Telekom, within the different units who have more of these mobile capabilities and the IT and the network capabilities. So my assessment is it's not completely easy to build a locally confined campus network which will have over the long run these 5G capabilities. Really, this would be my honest assessment. Nevertheless, that does not suggest that there are people who believe that they can do, right? Yeah. So let's see. We had lots of WiMAX networks being built or Wi-Fi networks, local networks. I mean, these kind of things, localized networks have existed for a long time. Um, maybe uh, Robert um, wants more. Yeah, just uh, I also struggled with the 4G, 5G charts. Just to ask whether it's th those, that chart is on the like for like from a spectrum perspective or are you sort of assuming that the 4G has higher cost spectrum? And then my question is... Um, uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Don't be frightened. Um, I forgot what I was going to say now. Yeah, my second question is, yeah, you made it very clear what the advantages of having IP and the, and the, uh, the, the uh, benefits to customer service, etc., within country, but do you think by having the multiple networks, all IP, you actually did demonstrate scales by having multiple countries on IP? Did it help you introduce NBIOT or um, the TV service across multiple countries by having all IP? So um, I start with the last question. First of all, the biggest impact from the IP migration um, was actually happening country per country. The major lessons learned was that we got smarter as we went ahead. So we didn't duplicate mistakes. So it was more around learning yeah, from other countries and then implementing that into Germany. Um, Coming to your point on the pan-European network, uh, what we see here, the major benefit was actually an acceleration towards cloudification and not cross-market cost synergies. Yeah? So it was more around you can accelerate the cloudification approach and then, of course, you can implement certain services across the footprint. For example, Volte we did, or voice recording, or MVAS, and now we are actually discussing uh, to have one TV uh, solution for Europe. But it's mainly about time to market and getting smarter on the cloudification approach rather than having cross-country cost synergies. Right, so what was the first question? Okay, the first question was, he, he said, um, how do we assume that uh, 4G costs will go up. Um, yeah, I'm still, ah, the spectrum. Still, yeah. The spectrum. Mm -hmm. So, um, as I mentioned, we would assume that in order to do that 5G capacity upgrade overlay, we would need to have, like everyone else, 3.x gigahertz spectrum for doing that. Okay. A last question from Emmet. Sorry for today, because we need to move on to the demos. And dinner, very important. It's been long. Emmet? Yeah, thanks very much, Hannes. I've just got one very simple question, which is on the use cases for 5G. I've seen a lot of presentations from Qualcomm, from Ericsson, talking about the different use cases of 5G. And I guess when we look back on 3G, I guess the most exciting application was probably non-SMS data. When I look back on 4G, it might have been mobile video. What do you think the most exciting use case is for 5G? What can really move the needle for Deutsche Telekom maybe 10 years from now? Is it smart cities? Is it massive IoT? Is it autonomous vehicles? Or just any big picture thoughts? So first of all, I might say on our planning horizon, the most exciting pieces are really the fixed wireless access and the smart capacity upgrade, because that is actually what drives the business case. And I, I find that important to know, right? So it's not based on a revenue assumption which might happen in the year 2020. Having said that, 
I get actually very excited on a mid-term horizon about all that opportunities which require low latency and offloading storage and computing capacity into a cloud. All use cases, you can think about that. That is about more on a mid-term horizon, which would actually be an autonomous factory, which would be information augmented vision in a locally confined area, whether that is enhanced gaming in the consumer area or whether that is the technicians who need to use their hands or all that. So I do believe they will evolve like that. When you think about 10 years from now onwards, I mean, the good thing is that probably not many of us might be here, so I can predict something, but I'm really superbly excited about the possibilities of the real-time economy. Yeah? Even though I cannot tell you what is the killer application for that. Yeah? Because, you know, in the world where we were coming from, we got used to information being spread large scale. But now we move into a world where information gets created even larger scale. And somehow in a very automated and natural fashion. See, I would compare it, so you forgive me for the last philosophical remark, I would compare it more with a human body. Yeah? And in the human body you have your natural senses, you have your neurons who are very different and tuned to a certain sense, and you have your brain. And what you will see is little veins distributed everywhere, the clouds, the sensors, and the uh, connectivity. So fantasy is wide open, but I truly believe the real-time economy in 10 years from now will look very different from anyone who could actually predict it. The important message here, as you are the analysts here, is that we are actually getting prepared for that. Yeah? And therefore, for us, it is so important to do the 5G rollout economically viable in an overall stable CapEx envelope, but at the same time, get prepared with our Edge Cloud for the future. Yeah? And this is, by the way, where we founded a company called Mobile Edge X, which actually, with a community of developers and tech partners, will develop microservices to actually test that out. Yeah? So real-time economy is, for me, the name of the game, even though nobody knows what exactly that will look like. Fabulous. So, so we have a plan and we have a vision and also we want to leave something in the bag for the next CMD in uh, whatever, however many years time. It's not been decided yet. Thank you, Claudia. But you can stay here. I'm just going to do a bit of housekeeping and then we do the demos and, uh, you know, Claudia is, 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 is basically the one who um, is in, in charge, uh, although she won't present herself those, uh, those demos. Um, so we, uh, before we go to the demos that Claudia has already uh, uh, sort of uh, teased um, uh, and, and shown, we want to um, uh, say goodbye to the guys on the webcast. Uh, tomorrow we will start again at 9 a.m. sharp with our T-Mobile team and they will share with us uh, you know, they are, uh, I guess, their 5G vision as well. They have uh, a few of those. Um, and um, uh, before, um, now, after the demo sessions, uh, importantly, we will um, go to the evening event. It's across the courtyard there. Um, so on the way, you will pass the um, horizontal drilling machine and the trenching machine. So uh, to illustrate uh, that um, fiber in Germany is about digging. Uh, and it's, uh, it doesn't come cheap and you need to invest a lot of money for it and you know that has its benefits and it um, uh, has its uh, uh, negatives but it also has its benefits. I think that's the right way to put it. Um, then um, to make it cheaper we have uh, Walter Goldenitz who is doing the uh, fiber factory. It's going to be over there. Uh, we will have uh, the 5G illustrations, which will be in the central location there with uh, Antje. Uh, Antje Williams. And on the right, uh, we have Alex Choi, um, uh, you know, another one of those cool guys that you've seen before, so you can recognize him straight away, uh, to demonstrate uh, um, uh, augmented reality and edge computing for us. So uh, please join the groups that you have been assigned to. Uh, there will be a member of the IR team to, uh, to help you around, and afterwards you will be guided towards the evening event. Um, this will be in our uh, other building here, and uh, we'll have some food and some wine and uh, other stuff, uh, uh, and um, it will be next to our shop, so you can have a look around if you like, um, and uh, that's pretty much it for now. So um, 
demonstrator session 